You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, winner of the Share Care Emmy Award for Social Storytelling and the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and I'm digging into the mailbox today because I got a question about a topic that I think is pretty important because we bring it up at NASM quite a bit. And the question is this. Let me just read the email. It says, hi, Dr. Rick Ritchie. I pray that you're doing well. I have a question about altered reciprocal inhibition. Does altered reciprocal inhibition alter one's movement pattern? And then he goes on to ask, say for instance, uh, you're observing someone doing a squat and their knees are moving in and they're showing knee valgus. I know there are overactive muscles that call, cause movement compensation, but does it also, uh, is that because of reciprocal inhibition? Mark. All right, Mark, thanks for asking the question. So I think first we need to identify what reciprocal inhibition is. And it's very important to point it out. Um, for instance, so when you activate a muscle in one range of motion, so usually the range of motion that it concentrically performs, then when you start to move outside of that range of motion, it gets inhibited. So for instance, think about this. Doing um, elbow flexion, so a bicep curl in a supinated position. Well, elbow flexion while supinated is really, really good at working the biceps, the biceps brachii. But as soon as I go into a neutral position with my hand or a pronated position in my hand, the biceps brachii does not engage as much. Why? Because the biceps brachii does elbow flexion and it does forearm or radio ulnar supination. Well, if it does that concentrically, then as I go into a neutral grip or a pronated grip, then I inhibit the bicep by taking it out of its range of motion that it performs concentrically. Now, will the biceps still work? Yes. But it's going to give more focus on the brachioradialis or the and the radialis as we start to inhibit the biceps brachii. Well, another example, and this is an example because I just thought about it um, over the evening. I was thinking about doing this. Is that I was pointing my foot in bed and I was clenching my toes like this, and my foot started to cramp. So the muscles in the bottom of my foot started to cramp. So what do you immediately do when when your muscle cramps? usually you go into the opposite direction as fast as possible. So what does that do? That inhibits the muscle that is cramping. So I'm flexing my toes and I'm plantar flexed and immediately it starts to cramp and I dorsiflex and I extend my toes and that cramping goes away. So what happened? Well, as I was concentrically plantar flexing and flexing my toes, the muscles become a little more overactive. They get very short and they start to go into this little Charlie horse thing. And then in order to inhibit it, we activate the other side. We stretch those muscles, which will inhibit it. We reciprocally inhibit them by moving them out of the direction that they concentrically activate in. All right. Well, all of that makes sense. So I guess one of the bigger things that we get are things like, um, you hear this about hip flexors a lot, right? So hip flexors reciprocally inhibiting the glutes. And then I'll get to your valgus comment, right? So my hip flexors, and I'm, I'm in hip flexion a lot. So could that lead to a, a shortening in the hip flexors, a positional shortening? that when I start to stand now, they positionally stay in a hip flexed position. Yeah, that's true. And it can reciprocally inhibit my glutes. Why? Because when I flex my hip, it reciprocally inhibits the glutes. If I internally rotate, then my glutes are an external rotate and it can reciprocally inhibit the glutes. So reciprocal inhibition is just when you've got muscles that um, that you're going into a range of motion that is not part of its concentric muscle action. So that can reciprocally inhibit. 
Well, I think where you get to altered reciprocal inhibition is there's kind of this steady state activation of a muscle, this, this hypertension of a muscle that reciprocally inhibits another muscle. And that's possible. Certainly that can happen. If I stay in a position where, uh, let's say I'm, I overwork my biceps so much that my biceps just stay flexed, then that is a constant state of reciprocally inhibiting my triceps. Uh, same thing with my hip flexors. If and and this is I I like to think about this more for people who do a lot of leg raises or knee raises, chin uh, knee tucks to work their abs, and they get a lot of hip flexors, and then they seem to be positioned in an anterior tilted position. Well, then yes, that anterior tilt of the pelvis will reciprocally inhibit your glutes. Why? Because you're in a hip flexed position. And so when you go into a position that's opposed to the concentric activation pattern of a muscle, then that will reciprocally inhibit. That's what reciprocal inhibition is. Altered is I'm staying in an altered state of doing so. I am in a constant state of activation in the hip flexors, overactive, or in the example that you gave, which was talking about knee valgus. So let's say... Let's talk about the two primary culprits here, my adductors and my TFL. So my adductors adduct, my TFL internally rotates my hips. So if I'm adducted and internally rotated, that's the one-two punch. So what is that going to do to my glute medius and my glute maximus? It is going to reciprocally inhibit. And if I stay in that position, that is my state of that is my posture, then that is a constant state or an altered state of reciprocal inhibition. Now, there's such thing, and I think this is important to point out, there is such thing as a co-contraction. What does that mean? That means I'm holding on to weights and I'm doing a bicep curl. My tricep is firing like crazy to help stabilize my elbow joint. That's fine, but my tricep is trying to stabilize. My hip flexors will help to stabilize my spine and my hips while my glutes drive me up in a standing position from a squatted position. There are co-contractions that take place. Think about it. In a squat, your quads and your hamstrings, your calves and your anterior tibialis, everything's firing. It's just... We need the ones that are doing the lifting, the concentric action to fire more. And then you've got this co-contraction taking place. So it's not like just because a muscle on one side is firing, the other side is not firing. That is not necessarily how it works. It can. That is a form of altered reciprocal inhibition. But the fact is co-contractions can take place. So I don't think you can just... Um, just lay a blanket statement out there and say, oh, well, your hip flexors are tight, so now your glutes don't work. Well, that's that's not necessarily how it works. That is not necessarily what we're talking about. But if you're in an altered position where you're hip flexed, then you're hip flexed and your glutes inhibit to be in a hip flexed position, just like I do with my biceps. And you can do that with your biceps. Just, just bend your elbow and you can... So, oh, there's the bicep. And then if I do that, all right. So for those of you listening, so I'm supinated. I'm making my bicep muscle, right? And then I'm supinated with my grip. And as soon as I pronate with my grip, I can, you can see the bicep lengthen when I pronate my grip. Well, that's going to happen when I add up to my legs uh, at the my hips. My glute medius is giving passage for that to happen. So it can co-contract, but it's losing the battle. And so are we choosing that? If we're choosing it, that's normal. It's normal that I go into pronation and my bicep, my radial ulnar pronation uh, or a neutral grip, and that inhibits my biceps brachii, right? That's normal. But a reciprocal inhibition that is altered is that there are muscles that are going into a position that I'm not asking for. I'm not requesting it. They are overactive. They're pulling me out of position and then it inhibits the other muscle, 
which means there is a muscle that is too strong moving me into a range of motion that I do not desire. And there is a muscle too weak, incapable, at least in a neurological sense where we are not making a decision to stay neutral. It's just when I might I squat and my knees knock together, I'm not consciously doing that. A reciprocal inhibitory pattern is taking place where the adductors engage more and the abductors engage less. I am out of a neutral position. Altered reciprocal inhibition is indeed taking place. And when that happens, I have altered length tension relationships. I have an altered neuromuscular recruitment. And all of these go together to identify what happens when I have altered movement patterns. All of them. All of them. Altered reciprocal inhibition, altered length tension relationships, and altered neuromuscular recruitment. And you can kind of put those things out. You're like, there's three headers right there, and they all point to one thing. Usually that one thing is postural, um, uh, undesired postural positioning, right? So whether that's a transitional assessment, like a squat, whether that is a movement assessment, whether that's locomotion, right? I'm walking or I'm running, uh, doing a, a step up to something, then that's going to be identified that when there is a postural issue going on, then usually you have those three things taking place. So the question is, does altered reciprocal inhibition alter one's movement patterns? Uh, the answer is yes. As soon as you move into a position, then you inhibit another muscle on the opposing side. Now, is that an altered length tension relationship? It depends on if it's a choice, if it's a pattern that you're going into and it is not an optimized pattern, but you say, hey, I'm going to show you this and I squat and I knock my knees together so you can see it. That's an altered. That is that is reciprocal inhibition, but I showed you that on purpose uh, to explain it, to, to present it so that you can see it. If I do it unintentionally and that is an altered pattern, then altered reciprocal inhibition, altered length tension relationship, altered neuromuscular recruitment are all taking place. Mark, I hope you found that helpful and uh, and and I appreciate you reaching out. And for all, everybody else who's listening, if you've got questions, you want to reach out to me, please do so. You can hit me up on Instagram at dr.rickritchie or you can email me at rick.ritchie at nasm.org. Y'all keep inspiring people to fitness. Thanks for listening. Like, subscribe, share with your fitness friends and family. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.